Hi, uh, this is Mark Elliott uh, with Tiffany Wong here, and welcome to Office Hours 23. This is the Office Hours for the module, The Qing Vision of Empire, which uh, we hope you enjoyed. So we have uh, some general announcements, which I will allow uh, Tiffany to do, since I'm new at the Office Hours thing. She's a, an experienced veteran. I'll put that in her hands. No, but we wanted to congratulate all of you who earned certificates for Part 5. 1,239 learners did, so congratulations. That's a lot. Yeah, it is. Wow, great. Yeah. And just so you know, it will still remain open until the end of the whole China X course. So if you haven't gotten a chance to finish it, you still have a chance until we finish part 10. So, so that's lots of time still. That is lots of time yeah. still. You can do it, I'm sure. And we're very excited that you're excited to have Professor Elliot here. Um, and we will work on improving the audio in the future. I know some of you commented on that. And um, we will also take into consideration your comments about keeping maps and images on screen longer. Um, and we saw that you had um, quite a few further questions that you had for us. Yeah, they're great. Uh, there, there, there are a lot of them here. I'm very, very pleased to have so many. I'll be thinking about these as I continue to, uh, uh, to, to work on, uh, on, on these lectures. Uh, one of the ones that I thought was most interesting and uh, worth talking about was uh, this one. It says, uh, or asks, why uh, or how could a less developed culture conquer and govern in a better way than a more sophisticated one. Uh, and uh, the, uh, there are some examples here uh, referencing uh, Rome being conquered by the barbarians uh, uh, and, uh, and so forth. And this is a question we get a lot, I think. Uh, it goes back to the, uh, the other problem of how so few, apart from the fact that they were from a much less developed civilizational background, uh, but also much fewer in number. How are they able to, uh, to to conquer and then to rule? As some of you pointed out in your comments, it's easy, relatively easy to conquer, much harder to hold on to power. So I think that the, there are a variety of answers you can come up with to this question, but one of the most important ones is the fact that the Manchus were extremely well organized uh, and uh, very tightly disciplined. Uh, and the fact that they were smaller in number, in fact, may have given them an advantage uh, in that respect. Uh, they were organized in a very strict military fashion. Uh, they were able to, uh, they were broken up into smaller groups, so they were able to move around in a very uh, uh, rapid uh, way uh, when called upon by, or, or called upon by, by circumstances to do so. So that's one of the, I think, one of the main reasons why civilizational uh, development, and that itself is, of course, kind of a, a problematic concept. Uh, but where that uh, comes uh, less into play uh, and organization really matters the most. And we saw the same yes. thing, of course, with the Mongols yes. in the earlier, yes. uh, earlier modules. And I think something also, the Ming were weaker at that time and there's a lot of internal rebellion already. That's right. And I think that might also be play the case in other um, situations in other parts of the world as well. Well, certainly that's something else to, to point out in the case of the Ming in the late Ming period, apart from internal rebellion, Court politics in the late Ming was incredibly factionalized. And uh, just a few years before, well, I guess it was about 20 years before the conquest, the Ming executed their very best general, right. uh, part of a, a, a yes. response to a, to a political plot. Yes. Uh, so they weren't doing themselves any favors no. by letting that kind of political infighting get the better of them. No, they weren't. So but thank you for that question. That's a really good question. And then, again, we have many excellent uh, other uh, follow-ups here. Yes. Um, there's um, one here, oh no, this one near yes. the uh, near the bottom. Uh, the uh, learner writes, "I'm interested whether they, meaning the Manchus, just enjoyed being warriors and fighting rival clans, or whether it was climate or a shortage of resources that spurred them on." Uh, and uh, pointing out that it's such a big difference being a ruler of a local regional kingdom as opposed to ruling all of China. Uh, was it really just the strength and charisma of a single person like Nur Hachi or, or Hong Taiji? Uh, and again, this is a question that comes up very frequently with respect to uh, these uh, northern dynasties, the conquest yes. dynasties that we'll, we'll talk about in, in a little bit more in a second. Um, and it comes up also with the Mongols. Yes. Right? Uh, and this was a question actually that Chinese uh, politicians asked themselves. How come these people come 
and give us such a hard time. Why don't they just stay home? Uh, they must want our stuff. Uh, and so you have a popular kind of a, uh, explanation for the uh, dynamic behind uh, incursions from the northern uh, peoples, so-called needy or greedy. Uh, either they, they lack stuff, and they, they, whether it's food or fineries or, or whatever it might be, labor, uh, and, and therefore uh, there's, a shor there's a shortage of some kind, and they seek to address that by um, invading uh, or raiding. Uh, uh, or they're greedy, and it's just in their nature as nomads to uh, give uh, give way to, to these kinds of desires. Uh, and uh, you know, I think that when we look at the way that these states develop, uh, there are arguments about uh, many ice ages, about relative drought, uh, this kind of thing that uh, sometimes is pointed to as a short-term factor that may have led to uh, some, uh, uh, some particular events or some particular uh, uh, points in the development of, of nomadic states. But by and large, what, ha what happens is once you start growing, and this is well explained, I think, in uh, uh, a very famous article about uh, the Mongols by Joseph Fletcher, who used to teach here. Uh, once you start to grow as a, as a, as a uh, nomadic confederacy, uh, you need to keep growing, because if you stop growing, you fall apart. Uh, and so there's a kind of built-in dynamic that means you have to keep getting more and more stuff, uh, more goods, more people, more wealth to continue to distribute. Uh, and the tricky part then is shifting from an economy that is built on booty right. to an economy that is built on taxation. Uh, and this is something that over the centuries, as the nomadic states like the Liao, uh, the Jin and the Yuan and later the Qing, uh, as they learned from past experience, they became better and better right. at doing that kind of thing. Uh, so there is, a, there is a, a, a point at which you have to stop raiding. Uh, you can't continue to live by booty. And you, need, you need to start <laughs> taxing uh, to sustain yourself. Yes. So I wouldn't read that as any kind of uh, particular uh, inherent aspect of uh, so-called the nomadic w nature or, or, or nomadic way. The M Manchus, after all, were not really nomads nomadic. in the first place, right? Yeah. Right. And I think there was one more question. Um, how important were the literati during these dynasties? Yeah. And how did Qing relate to the countries outside their empire? So these are, these are both uh, excellent uh, questions, and we didn't really talk about, I didn't talk much about the literati in this last one. Couple of modules. But they definitely, they come back into the picture. You'll see certainly in, uh, uh, in the second uh, of the Qing modules. Yes. Uh, talk more about uh, about the shir, uh, and okay. I know that with Professor Bowl we can never forget the shir completely, mm -mm. Uh, and the shir will come back, believe me. Yes. And then, as far as uh, foreign relations, again, uh, particularly in uh, modules three and four, uh, we'll 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 talk about that because that's also something, of course, with real relevance to uh, modern Chinese history in the 19th and 20th centuries. Yes, yeah. and I think also in the scholars they will. Yes, back. yes, of course, and the scholars, they take center stage, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And now, turning to the discussion. So we've given you a discussion question that asked you to think about the conquest dynasty uh, as, a, as a type, as a model, uh, and uh, provided some, some basic information there, uh, sort of recapping some of what uh, uh, we covered in the module and then asking you to think about the differences between conquest dynasties and the Song dynasty, say, or the Ming, which are not typically thought of as, as conquest dynasties. What are the things that conquest dynasties share? Uh, why did the Qing pick the, the, uh, the Liao, Jin, and Yuan as, as regimes that they would want to identify themselves with? And what were the problems uh, in, in doing that kind of thing? And uh, again, since this is my first week uh, uh, actually um, lecturing in China X, um, I uh, had not before looked at the discussion uh, responses that, uh, that you get. And I am just really impressed by the number and by the quality of uh, the uh, discussion online uh, that, uh, uh, that students provide. It's really, really tremendous. Uh, and I hope it's okay if I take some of these questions back into the classroom here at Harvard because there's there's some great stuff uh, great stuff in here we don't have a lot of time I'm afraid to go over all, all of them, them 
uh, but we have picked out a, a few here that uh, um, uh, I think were, were worth uh, 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 talking about just, uh, just a little bit. So uh, the first one, this is from J.M. Worsley. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, learner writes, uh, I don't necessarily believe that all, quote, native Han dynasties were actually all that native either. In some cases, earlier, again, quote, Han Chinese dynasties could actually be seen as conquest dynasties as well. From the perspective of the southern dynasties, who felt that they were the true inheritors of the Han civilization, the Sui were just another, another alien conquest dynasty. The ruling families of both the Sui and the Tong were quite distinct in their culture from the southern dynasty clans, being closely intermarried and aligned with the northern Turkic ruling classes. So reading this, I wonder if this, uh, if J.M. Worsley, in fact, had sat in on one of my lectures uh, here on campus, because I, I make this very point. Uh, and it's, so it's very, uh, very well taken. Indeed, on some level, uh, for a couple of reasons, the idea of a conquest dynasty is, uh, uh, is problematic. One is that, of course, all dynasties come to power by virtue of military conquest. I mean, that's, no one's going to give you power just if you ask for it nicely, pretty right. please. Uh, it requires uh, military force. Uh, so the idea of the conquest dynasty is not that conquest was unique to, these, to the establishment of these dynasties, but that these dynasties carry a particularly strong military marker and that military force remains uh, much more central to the identity of the dynasty than to the identities of dynasties that uh, were founded by uh, Han Chinese, like the Song and the Ming. Uh, the other is that, of course, even some of those dynasties, like, uh, say, the Tang, which are not usually thought of as conquest dynasties, in fact, could be thought of as such, and uh, we, could, we could say that. Uh, the Tang, after all, uh, in terms of uh, the, the imperial clan, was very much an inner Asian uh, family, strong connections to the steppe. Right, right. Same with the Sui. Uh, these were families uh, uh, related to the Tabgach, who had founded the Northern Wei dynasty. Uh, and uh, another, um, oh no, it's, it's J.M. Worsley as well, who mentions the fact that uh, the eldest son of Tang yes. Taizong loved to eat yogurt. Uh, yeah. He preferred to live in a tent. He was very, yeah. very much uh, a, yeah. you know, loved, liked a Turkic lifestyle. Yeah, so these are things that Professor Bull mentioned in his lecture right. as well. Right, right. So we might indeed uh, want to soften the bright distinction between conquest dynasties right. and so-called native dynasties and think about these things as rather lying on a spectrum mm -hmm. uh, with uh, uh, Tang maybe somewhere in the middle, right. Qing, uh, and then maybe yeah. further out, Yuan, yes. uh, uh, on, uh, toward toward the end of that uh, end of that spectrum. So this was a really uh, a really valuable uh, point, I think, that was made. Uh, and then there was another uh, uh, comment, uh, uh, quite a quite a, uh, a good comment, I think, made by S. Tran Trout, noting that conquest dynasties are not unique to China. Uh, that we see similar kinds of political uh, arrangements in other parts of the world as well. Right. Uh, and as Trantrout brings out uh, the example of the Norman Conquest, which I actually will talk about a little bit in, uh, in a later lecture, yes. uh, about uh, Romans actually, of course, they were also originally conquerors, yes. uh, and they regarded Greece as being decadent and weak, yes. and they were the virile uh, uh, martial people. Uh, Virgil's uh, uh, Aeneid is very much all about uh, uh, that martial spirit that animated Rome. Uh, the uh, Ottomans, uh, another example. Uh, yeah. This is not mentioned here, but the, uh, the example also of the Mughals who conquered northern India and set up the Mughal dynasty, which these were descendants uh, ultimately, people claim partly anyway, descent from, uh, from the Mongols. Uh, so this is not a... a uh, a type of uh, political uh, regime that's by, by, uh, that, that's by any means that's unique uh, to China. Right. And the other thing I liked about uh, S. Tran Trout's comments here uh, was the reference to the fact that the, uh, the, the uh, royal family, the Hanover royal family in England, in yes. fact, were German originally. Yes. Uh, and uh, that uh, the current Prince Philip of Great Britain was a royal of both the Greek and Danish households. Yes. Uh, and this gets us, again, out of thinking in the framework of the nation state, right. which I think is very easy for us to fall 
into. And remember that we're talking about an empire in which modern notions of nation and language and ethnicity all needing to line up were not necessarily universally shared. We do see some elements of this among certain Chinese intellectuals where there, there is a belief uh, that uh, uh, you need to be ethnically Chinese to be uh, the ruler of China, but not everybody thought that that was the case. Uh, so uh, uh, this, uh, this point and then the fact of minority rule, which is also, again, not so uncommon. Uh, is, uh, uh, is, a, is a very good point. So I thought that that was really nice from a comparative perspective to bring that, uh, to bring that out. Now one, of the, one other part of the discussion question asked you to think about uh, why the Manchus would have uh, identified themselves with the Khitans, the Jurchens, and the Mongols, as I, as I noted uh, uh, that, they, that they did. And we have a good answer here Oh, we have many good answers on this point. Uh, Karen Brunemann uh, wrote in, uh, and uh, she says, uh, I think the Manchu founders of the Qing chose to identify with the Khitans, Jurchens, and Mongols for various reasons. One could be to demonstrate continuity, to build upon the myths and traditions of those more ancient peoples. Another reason could have been that they wanted to demonstrate that they were the legitimate rulers of these peoples, thus ensuring their support. However, such identification could potentially cause problems in that rivalries could emerge or concessions had to be made to prevent unrest between those peoples. So uh, definitely I think that the idea here of uh, wanting to demonstrate continuity uh, and to look at, uh, to, to remind people that there had been previous uh, 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 rulers, uh, at least of North China, uh, in the case of the Khitans and the, the Jurchens, uh, who had uh, taken power and had been regarded um, as, uh, uh, at least again by, by some, not all necessarily, mm. as the legitimate uh, powers, that this was something that they could borrow off and, 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 and use to their advantage. Now, we should point out that by the time we get to the uh, early 1600s, there are no more people calling themselves Khitans. And the, there are people calling themselves Jurchens, but the Manchus quite self-consciously Rename themselves, right? Yes. Uh, and they get rid of the name church, in which they then make illegal, actually, and they, they expunge it from the record as much as they can. So this is part of the the, the, the baggage, uh, and that's the, the, the uh, we'll get to another comment in a minute. Uh, the problem of identification with with these earlier peoples is that the Jurchens, in particular, had been a tributary people of the Ming. And the Manchus, the, the Qing, did not want to have that kind of connotation. So they wanted, at this, on the one hand, to um, borrow that sort of uh, sense of continuity with, with the past. Uh, but at a certain point, it became a liability. And at that point, they, uh, they got rid of it. Another reason, and I didn't see this actually in, in, in the responses, another reason that they looked to the example of these previous conquest dynasties was to see uh, the uh, successes and failures right. that those regimes had had. So in the uh, Manchu translations of the Liao Jin and Yuan histories, in the preface there, um, the emperor's edict, which orders the translation, is, uh, appears right at the beginning of the book. Mm -hmm. And he said, um, one of the reasons I'm, I'm ordering this translation is we want to know what these people did well, but we also want to know where they made their mistakes. Right. Uh, so this is a classic move that we see in China and other places, which is that you, you turn to the historical record uh, to try and figure out what you can do better than people who were coming from more or less the same place that you were. So that was one other thing that uh, was attractive about that, that legacy. And then baggage. So Nick Leonard writes, the potential problem with this is that it saddled the Manchus with baggage right from the start. Uh, and uh, the, he writes, uh, the majority Han might have uh, taken these weaknesses and negative aspects as they saw them and assigned them to the Manchus, whether justified or not. It meant that the Manchus couldn't come in with a clean right. slate. Uh, and that's true. Uh, and this is where, as I say, yes. they, they, they tried to have it both ways. Yes, they tried to have a clean slate with Qing and um, having the new name Man Manchu as a a new term for them. Right. And then having the double connotation of Qing as clean um, and also as warrior. Right, right. So I don't know how many people they uh, 
they actually persuaded right. that they didn't have any prior connection with those northern peoples, I don't think very many at all. And in fact, in later writings, they, they go back again and they uh, associate themselves with the earlier royal houses, imperial houses mm -hmm. of the Jin in particular. Uh, but it did, it did complicate the situation uh, just a bit. Uh, but that was, and that was just one of the challenges that, that never went away for the Manchus, and it came back to haunt them big time uh, at the end of the, at the end of the dynasty. Yeah. Now, there's, there's one last uh, comment that I, I found uh, really delightful, uh, and this is from D.J. Eaton Lisbon, uh, who, uh, and the title of the, of the post is, Ostriches and Penguins in the Republic of Birds. It's a, it's a wonderful intervention here. Uh, it starts off asking this question, which appears irrelevant, but in fact is very relevant. If all the birds of the world came together and created their own republic, their own cultural and economic bird world, how would ostriches and penguins fare? So this is a question about otherness. Yes. Right? This is a question about alterity and about normativity. So the, uh, uh, the idea here um, is that you know, we take birdness right. as meaning what? What's the most defining feature of a that bird? They can fly. That it can fly, right? Yeah. But then we have some birds. creatures that are classified as birds and think of themselves as birds, birds. who don't fly. So what do we do with those birds, those not bird birds or unbird-like birds, yeah. when they come, for example, if they wanted to take over bird world? We right? think that they are not birds. Right. And so, so DJ Eaton Lisbon writes, I imagine that sooner or later, ostriches and penguins would not be content to be treated as second-class birds. They might develop a pride in their own distinctive characteristics while asserting their full right to membership in the bird community. They might sooner or later succeed in moving themselves from the periphery to the center of the bird world. Then the community's notion of birdness would have to be altered to be accepting of flightless birds, and the community as a whole would be more diverse and would be stronger. And then the last paragraph makes the analogy with yes. the Manchus as, in fact, altering this notion, not of birdness, but of what it meant to be civilized. Right. right? Uh, which is a, a, a very old, uh, and you've run, we've come upon this earlier in the, mm -hmm. in the class, uh, an old conversation uh, that the Chinese, uh, people calling themselves Hua, have been having with the peoples on the borders, the Yi, uh, mm -hmm. for centuries and centuries. Yes. Yes. And uh, it's a conversation that uh, continues today yes. uh, and is one that was really brought to a point uh, in, uh, in the Qing. Uh, and I just, I found that this, uh, this, this uh, allegory of the ostriches and penguins in the Republic of Birds, I like also that it's a Republic of Birds, yes. not an empire of birds, provides yes. a kind of notion of equality that probably wasn't there in empire, I don't think. Uh, ostriches, after all, pretty big birds if they wanted to take over. They got really organized. Yeah. Maybe they could do it. They could maybe do it. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you so much. Thanks again. Yes. We look forward to more of your uh, comments and questions for next week. And thank you, Tiffany. And thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.